Thank you, Billy. Good morning, beautiful family. Thank you so much for, for being here this morning. Naples Community Church family is the best. I'll tell you, I've been going to church for many, many years and, and uh, was talking to somebody earlier and I would really miss it if I wasn't here. And I just wake up with such a joy in my heart that I can be here. So thank you all for being part of that. We are so excited. This is gonna be a great week. We had, um, well, last week was fabulous. We had our uh, luncheon, thanks to Nancy Johnston at Gray Oaks. We all were uh, guests of hers, so to speak, on her patio overlooking that beautiful, beautiful clubhouse, beautiful lunch. Thank you to all the ladies who, who were able to come to that. Um, June is gonna be fantastic, but let's go through this week. We've got our Bible study, or on Mondays, I was going to say um, Sunday mornings. If you, don't, if you get here early and want to have prayer with Dawn up in the sunshine room, it's just spectacular, and it's a great place to uh, prepare. Dawn prays over the service, her pastor, for just you know the Holy Spirit getting here before we do. So join her. Uh, Monday or yeah, Monday is the Bible study that she leads, and there she does two great events. Noon is for everybody, and 6 p.m. is for the ladies. You can sign up if you haven't given your email to um, Zen or to one of our greeters to get the email that tells you about all the things that are coming up. We have so many ways to just keep you in touch with what's going on. And getting that email, you can click right on it, it goes to the website, you can click and get on Zoom to go to the Bible study or any of these events, which is so, um, it's just so helpful to do that. So, Wednesdays, we have our, our day with pastor. We've got issues hour at 11, and Bible study at four. Again, you can come in person, which is so powerful, but Zoom is okay too. I wanted to draw your attention to the beautiful flowers we have today. Mary and McKeague, gorgeous. We have uh, Jean's Flores providing those, but those are in loving memory of her mother and her late husband. So thank you so much, Mary, and appreciate those beautiful flowers. And the cookies, we have a love fun day today. As, as you probably know, Shirley Pestle provided the beautiful cookies today. And of course, we always have healthy snacks too. So please enjoy that. And we also have lunch provided, a little light lunch today, because as you know, it's member spotlight day with Mike and Cindy Lister. I hope you've all read this, but if you haven't, just go after service, grab a little cookie, grab some coffee, come on back in five or 10 minutes and enjoy that great spotlight with the two of them. They have so much to share and that's gonna be really exciting. It's a fun time. And then we have a little lunch afterward. Thank you, Mary and the, um, the hospitality group for getting all that lunch together all the time. Um, I'm just I'm just a little nervous today. My, my, I, I don't know why. Well, I do know why. I was listening to my Christian music this morning. I'll tell you, I do, do some of you do that and just really get touched? Sometimes more than others. I'll tell you. Um, how about these lyrics? I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. Amen. And then I heard this one. It's called My Father's House. So amazing. Lay your burdens down here at your father's house. Leave your shame at the door. It's not welcome anymore here in the father's house. And don't you just feel it? I love that love is on the move when the father's in the room. And love is breaking through when love is in the room, when the father's in the room. So I just would like to again thank Pastor Kurt for just creating this amazing environment for the Holy Spirit to come be with us every Sunday. It's so amazing. Um, I'd like to also just recognize that Domine is gonna share her beautiful voice this morning with Dawn, and also one of her lovely sisters, and your eyes are not deceiving you. She's the twin of the one we met a couple of weeks ago, so. <laughs> and uh, I am just, I'm just thrilled with what we do here at, at the church. June, let me go on and on. June, buckle up. We have our usual events. We've got dates on the calendar, so please sign up. Mary loves when you sign up because we need reservations and how much food to get and all those kind of things. So movie night is Wednesday, June 8th, and the movie is to be determined. So 
buckle up for that. That's going to be fun. All church brunch, which is always a fun event. That's how I got my dad to Christ, I think, because he, he loved coming to the all church lunches and being with everyone. That's June 12th, and that's going to be right over here at this cafe. So we, need, we definitely need you to sign up and have, so we can get the reservation number for that. And our ladies' lunch, another ladies' lunch, Wednesday, June 15th, and that's going to be at The Fish Restaurant in Venetian Village. We just love, love you all so much. Can't wait to hear more about the listers, too. And uh, just God bless all of you. Thank you so much. Just one thing. I've got a mic. Yeah, they, they let me have a mic. Yeah. <laughs> So the video that we're about to see this morning is Marty Starkey's grandson. And Marty Starkey, Ron Schweier and Marty Starkey are up in Carmel, Indiana, dear friends of, uh, and members of this church. And um, she has, of course, started a ministry at Culver, Indiana, up in Culver. And uh, last year I was there for two times, and I'll be there at least one time this year. But I, she sent me this week, she sent us, a number of us, this video this week, and I just could not, not share it. Hi, this is Tao. I came to t tell you this story. So this man built his house on the rock, and this man built his house on the sand. So this man built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the floods came up, and, and that house stayed up. But this man built his house on the sand, he he built his house, and so the rain came down, the floods came up, and that house fell down, and 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 that that's all I know. But but God was the hope. You shouldn't build your house on the sand. You should build your house on God. Because God's our hero. Goodbye, nice for meeting you. Amen. Please join us in our I love to tell the story of unseen things above of Jesus and his glory of Jesus. Salvation. 
Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, it is such a privilege to gather in your son's holy name here at Naples Community Church in this building and online. And as some of us have heard this story, which is not a fable, it is 100% true. And history, your story, his story. Father, it's, it's hard for me to imagine living here in this incredible city, in this incredible country where we have, we celebrate we have a church on every corner, and yet I recognize the fact that there are people who still have not heard the amazing true story of how you love this world so much that you gave your only begotten son up on that cross, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It is truly a, 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 the most amazing reality. It is the good news. So Father, I pray that if there is somebody even here today in this congregation who has not grasped that concept, who has not really heard that story, Lord, like that darling little boy that we saw who knows out of the mouth of babe that the word Jesus speaking in Matthew 7, talking about Believing him who has said this, that he is the rock. And if those who listen to his words and do them, they are like the man that built his house on solid, the solid rock. Father, may we be a people that is constantly listening, doing what you've told us to do. Not building on sand which is shifting, which will absolutely wash away. But may we be building our lives on the foundation of Jesus, that rock. Father, everything that goes on here today, I pray that as Pastor Kurt brings your word to us, Lord, that you will uh, bring to recall the things that he has studied, and he's done a lot of studying. But Father, I pray that you would anoint his lips to uh, bring the exact words that somebody here that I might need to hear, that we might all need to hear. And as you are the teacher, your Holy Spirit is the teacher. And Pastor Kurt is a very, very wonderful vessel that you have placed over the flock of this congregation. I pray for the, the singing, the beautiful, these, my beautiful sisters as they sing your praises. Lord, I pray that you would be honored and glorified. I pray, Father, that we would get a, a taste of what you have prepared for us in eternity. Ask that you would be honored and glorified by everything that is done, said, here, now, and with uh, Mike and Cindy as well. Thank you again so much for my dear NCC family. I pray your blessing on each member represented here and their families. And it is in Jesus' precious name I ask this. Amen. When I am a wasteland, you are the water. When I am the winter, you are the fire that burns. When I
You say there's a treasure You look till you find it You search To find me What have I done? so good it was like Millie Vanilli doing the uh, lip syncing thing. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is such a joy to have you both. They're, they're, they are two of ten children in the family. And um, I asked them before the service if there were ever any fights. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> but it's such a joy to have you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I don't know if you've all had an opportunity to meet Dustin Hurl. Dustin is a new father for the third time as of this week. Dustin, can you come out real quick? Yeah. So, so we are so thrilled to have Dustin. He's just a, a guru of all the tech stuff that we do. And their little girl, Tessa, um, was delivered by C-section, but that little one had the umbilical cord wrapped three times around. And so we are so grateful. And, and Dustin and his wife had lost a little one along the way because of this. And so we are so we're so grateful. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you. All right. God bless. <laughs> and last week, Mike, Mark Shoreland showed up like the prodigal son. I mean, he was greeted by Gloria, left her seat and gave him a hug, and then afterwards, everyone was hugging him. And um, this week, he gave birth to his first grandchild, but his daughter lost 40% of her body's blood in the process. And so it was a very scary time. Both are doing so well, and we are so grateful. And um, we also have been keeping um, <clears throat> Bruce and Glenna Hayhoe 
in our prayers. And Glenna tells me this morning that Bruce is back home. The trouble is he's got attitude. <laughs> so I guess that means he's doing okay. And of course, we continue to pray for Joanne Hughes, who um, is in rehab and is uh, looking toward getting help from a Val hospice going forward. Let's bow together in prayer. Dear Lord, what did we do to, to receive love like this? Well, we just showed up, and you loved us. We were conceived in your mind even before we were conceived in the womb. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that it is your love that continues to pursue us all the days of our lives until that day when you greet us face to face. Lord, until then, we, we have, in this life, we have trouble, as our Lord reminded us. And so it's so critical that we pray for one another, uphold one another, and Lord, that we encourage each other through the difficult times and enjoy one another when things are, are easy and fine. But Lord, may we, may we be aware that everyone upon whom we lay our eyes is beloved by you. They are our neighbor. They're one to whom we have been called to in some way reflect the tenderness of your love to them. So, and so, dear Father, when contention arises, when there are disagreements, when there are hard relational realities to deal with, remind us, O oh Lord, that although we may view that other person as very wrong, that other person is nevertheless very loved. And our opinions, O oh Lord, come and go. They change over time, so how important are they really? What doesn't change is your love. What doesn't change is, is the high calling to which we've been called as we acknowledge that you are that you are the one who loves us so much. And when we simply surrender our lives to that love, receive it, and allow our lives to be changed by it. So, Lord, even as we worship you this morning, yes, we want you to be glorified, but it's not that we want you to be glorified here, we want you to be glorified out there. Because church is really in session the moment we leave. That's when we engage. That's when we, that's when we meet others. That's when we carry on the work of everyday life. And so, dear Father, we ask your special empowerment in all of our lives, that we might not be found worthy because we won't be found worthy, but we might be found worthy because of the blood of your Son which flows over us and washes us clean and makes us yours. And dear Father, may we give him all praise and glory, not just with our lips, but with our lives. We ask this even as we pray as your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. To further the work of our, our Lord in this community, we bring to God our tithes and offerings.
Father, we are your church. We have been called out. And so, O oh Lord, we have been called out that we might be sent back and carry good news to all aching, longing hearts. And so, dear Lord, speak to us through your word. Empower us and enable us. We ask it in the name of your Son, who is the head of the church, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So in the Gospel of Matthew, after the resurrection, Jesus tells them to go to Galilee. And, and so they go. They go to Galilee to a particular hill. There are all kinds of guesses as to what hill it might be, but there are all kinds of hills up there, so it's one of those who knows things, but that's what scholars waste their time trying to figure out. Because <laughs> it doesn't really matter. But he goes, and he meets the disciples there. And so the disciples who have just experienced this reality of the resurrection see him now once again up in Galilee. Hear the word of God as it comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew. This is how he closes his letter. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. For lo, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. Word of the Lord. So the church is that which is in contrast to a human construct. We declare that Jesus Christ is head of the church, that he started it. And that on the day of Pentecost, as people of, of all over the place were gathered in Jerusalem, suddenly the Holy Spirit comes, and they all start speaking different languages. But the languages that they spoke were known languages. In other words, the disciples were given languages that they were never taught. But then, then here's Nathaniel, all of a sudden speaking Spanish. And, and here's Peter speaking in Latin. And so it was, they were given languages, tongues, so that they might go forth into the world and, and preach the gospel so that God might build his church. Now, this, this is in direct contrast to what we know about in the story of Babel. You remember that from Sunday school. <laughs> some, some walls of Sunday school classrooms have the Tower of Babel falling down. And the Tower of Babel is a, an effort on the, part of, on the part of people to build a monument, to build a utopian world, to build something to their own glory. And, and to do something that they believe will stand the test of time. And, and as they build, they think this will itself reach heaven. It's going to reach a level of perfection. And so they will, on earth, build this, this perfect system. The system that, that, will, that will handle all the world's problems, at least all the problems of that Babylonian community. And you know, we, we still do this. There's still this kind of effort. This, this utopian dream, this dream to build something that is, that is determinative of, of human destiny. Where we're going to build this, this paradise that, that everyone is going to be happy in. And all things will be, all things will be equal. 
and everyone will be so happy in this world that, that we build. And so God saw this and he brought an end to it. And the end that he brought to it was that although they were speaking with one another, they could not understand each other. They would speak, but others couldn't hear or couldn't understand. And in our own time, when we live in a time when it seems that so many people, so many entities, so many powers speak, but people don't understand. There's no communication going on. There's just conflict. Maybe, maybe we've been trying to build our own Tower of Babel here. Maybe we've been aspiring to do things our way. Maybe we've wanted it to be something that would be to our glory and our honor. And so we don't understand each other. We almost It's almost like speaking another language with each other. And this only serves to dismantle a culture and a society, as it happened in Babel. They couldn't understand each other. And so they too were scattered. They left. They went to their own place, and, and the result, of course, was tribalism, where they were all speaking just their own idiom, their own language. But the opposite of that is what God wants. And that is the obliteration of tribes. That, that the, the kingdom of God would be a place for every nation, every tongue, every tribe. And so, and so the Lord instructs them to go out and preach to all nations, to everyone. That all may come in and all may be a part of what God is intending to do. And so the disciples went. And they went and they paid a huge price, as you know, all but perhaps, we don't know exactly, but perhaps the Apostle John, who was in all likelihood the youngest of the disciples, they all died a martyr's death. But they did as they were told. They went and they preached the gospel. They simply spread the word. And they were just human. They were broken people just like all of us. But it, it managed to work. It managed to come together, not because of their efforts, but because of God's spirit. Martin Luther put it this way. While I drink my little glass of Wittenberg beer, the gospel runs its course. Now, mind you, look... Uh, his little glass of Wittenberg beer was actually a stein. <laughs> and on the inside of the stein were the Beatitudes, and at the bottom was the Lord's Prayer. And he used to pride himself in being able to chug all the way down to the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> but he wasn't going to worry about it. He wasn't going to worry because it was not by our effort. Our effort is simply to be obedient simply to, to do what we're called to do, to be church. And we're being, when we're being, just being church, when we're acting faithfully, then God, God takes over. God does what, what has to be done. And what I find astonishing about this text also, as we read this, we think, what on earth? Because the disciples there have seen the risen Lord. They saw him down in Jerusalem. Now they see him again up in Galilee. And then it says, and they doubted. You know, I think, well, if I, if I were there, I wouldn't doubt. But they doubted. And actually, I think that's really good news. That's good news because even those who saw the risen Christ had something stirring within them that gave rise to their doubt. And the reality of faith is, is that we, we cannot help but, but doubt at times. We just do. I've been in the ministry for over 40 years. 
And although I don't really struggle so much with doubt, but the, the reality is there are times when that creeps in. And, and my calling and our calling is not to preach our doubt. We can talk about it in class and that sort of thing. We don't preach our doubt. We preach the faith. But acknowledging the reality, our, our own humanity allows for the, the simple word to get alloyed by all that stuff that stirs within us. And what's unfortunate is when the church begins to veer over toward that, that place of doubt and become really a doubting reality, a doubting church. And the doubt can be so prominent, so dominant, that churches actually begin to relinquish the foundational realities of the faith through the scriptures and simply become a shill for the culture. We saw it happen in, in the 1930s in Germany. And one of the great theologians of the 20th century, Karl Barth, had this to say. When the church is, in, is encumbered with doubt, the life of the church becomes an end in itself. And he says, where the church is an end in itself, it usually begins to ta taste sacral, to act pious, to become priestly, and to turn sour. Anyone with a sensitive nose will smell that and find it dreadful. So church can operate without faith just by going through the motions. And, and we can act like we are so sacred and so pious and so, so godly. But it's a cover for the reality of faith having drained out. And we see it with all too much regularity. But the church is called to be a place and a people, more than a place, a people. The place is to be simply that which empowers us to be the church and, and to be a people sent into the world with a message, with good news, a message that is, that is active in our hearts but also lived out in our, in our lives. A message that is demonstrated in the way that we we are with one another. And, and in our time today, in our culture today, there's all kinds of surveys and inputs coming out about the, the lack of faith of so many and then the, the antagonism even of so many, of so many in our culture, entities in our culture that have become openly antagonistic to Christians and Christianity. And so it is such that the church has to be today not a lot unlike it was at the various times of, of its history. So in the first century, the church was a beleaguered minority in the Roman world. And they were subject to horrific beatings. Now we're subject to horrific tweetings. But the reality of social media is such that this kind of, this kind of discourse can go on and, and begin to break, break us down and wear us down. But we're in a time where the culture, the larger culture, is growing in its hostility toward the church. And so it's important for us to recognize that this is... This is not so much a culture that really likes us. The reality of church attendance in our, in our nation, there have been a couple surveys. One, Barna, the Barna Institute has, has simply asked how many, uh, in response to a survey, how many of you are active in church, and the number's always been around 50%, give or take. But when you actually count the number of people in the pews, 
It's more like 10%. The reality of church attendance, why, isn't, why aren't the streets crowded on Sunday morning coming down to church? Why is it Sunday morning that, oh, we can drive and it's not so many people on the road, except for Easter? So the church has become sort of, once again, a beleaguered minority. Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Amen. And, and so it's important for us to understand that it's, there's a time for us to stand not as politically defined, not as culturally defined, but as, as defined by our Savior. It's defined by the Lord to, to graciously, happily represent the reality of Christ wherever we are. We don't have to do it with a scowl. We don't have to do it as if we're somehow better than anyone else. The reality is we're not. We're the church. If anything, we know our sinfulness and our brokenness. But there's a time, and this is a time. So Helmut Thielicke was a German pastor during that same era as Karl Barth. And he said, the church is a mighty fortress from which we should launch our sorties into a world where there are co competitive competitions in professional life, educational needs for our children, anxiety about tomorrow, wild adventure, and joyful moments. There we do battle using the weapons given to us by the armory of the word, encouraged by the shouts that filter down to us from the walls of Jerusalem. He's a pastor from Stuttgart. His church was bombed out. The Nazis were constantly listening to him. He was so smart, he was able to preach over the heads of the Nazis in his congregation. And he maintained his pulpit through it all. Others such as Bonhoeffer, uh, Bart, Neumoller, others were arrested. This is a time for us to simply be the church and again, not in an arrogant manner, but in a manner that reflects the reality of our Lord as our head, the head of the church. I heard of a sweet example of what I'm talking about just recently. So we all know about what's going on with the uh, Supreme Court and the draft decision that's come down and then protests outside the, the homes of some of the justices. There were protests outside of Samuel Alito's home one evening. And my understanding is these protests are illegal, but they were going on anyway. And nevertheless, the protests were, were going on, and Samuel Alito was inside with his family. And then someone, and I've heard a couple reports, someone either from inside Alito's home or in a neighboring house, started playing the piano. Playing, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And that, that was taking, taking a stand for that which was legal, of course, but the least of that which is moral or ethical is that which is legal. But it wasn't an arrogant response. It wasn't going outside and going chin to chin with protesters. It was simply calling upon the Lord and for all of us to trust in him. And so the mission of the church is to be his body dispersed, his body in the world. And as we go face to face, let's not go chin to chin. How much better to go cheek to cheek, to love each other, to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us, and to reflect the nature of our risen Lord. That was the response of the disciples. They went into all nations, all that they could reach at that time. 
but the church has gone forth. As Luther sipped his little glass of Wittenberg beer, the kingdom of God went forth, and it goes forth to this day, and it goes forth in and through us. Will you join me in prayer? And so, Lord, we are not to be ugly. We're to reflect your beauty. We're not to be harsh. We're to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. But Lord, you call us. You give us this, this great challenge. And you make your promise that you will go before us and you will follow up behind us and you will be with us until the close of the age. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. May you please stand for our closing hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. Sunday school on Sunday mornings. And you can see in your own mind's eye that sweet, that sweet sight of little ones going to church. And what a sweet sight when God's children are, are walking in his way and being his children to the view of that world that is longing to know how loved they are. Go in peace, live by faith, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> pardon me, Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father,
the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and in the life everlasting.